Good morning. Um, hello, everybody. It's uh, very early. It's after the 64K Componite, so the audience here is as small as I expected, but I guess a lot of people will be watching this as a recording afterwards. So hello, everybody, on the recording. Um, welcome to the seminar on uh, My Little Funky Jesse Guitar Isn't Real. Uh, it's about how to synthesize good sounding sounds in size constrained environments like 32K, 64K, and the like. And it's um, going to be primarily targeted at people that already know a little bit how to create sounds. Like if you can output a sine wave and if you can output a saw wave, and if you think it sounds horrible, then we will teach you how to make stuff sound better and how, how to get up to the state of the art with synthesizing certain instruments. Um, let's start with who we are. Um, sitting next to me here is Barrow, and he's the one who is actually responsible for all this. He is um, a programming machine. Every piece of code that you can think of he has possibly written. Um, he is basically the one-man army behind all the uh, 64K releases by Farbrush in the last five years or so at least. And um, he is also especially um, focused on this talk, uh, the author of the, the Cream Tracker and Aulan framework that is being used for synthesizers. I am Urs of Mercury. I'm primarily acting as the voice here. So all the questions that you may have, you can address to Bero because I only have superficial knowledge of audio coding. Um, it's enough to fix floating point bugs, but then when it goes into more details, you should talk to Bero. But anyway, let's get started. Um, the first instrument that a lot of people when, they, when you start developing a synth and don't really know what you're doing yet, how do you do drums? I mean, when you think about you're hitting an object with another object, what comes out? What is the sound that comes out? And the, the most basic approach that everybody uses is take some noise pulses and then let's see how we get this to sound drummy. But if you don't really put your mind to how a drum works and how you can sy synthesize this, it will never sound like a real drum. Um, once you do a couple of easy improvements to your drum synth, uh, it will sound much better. And drums, when you, when you sit in front of the stage at revision <laughs> during the compos, and the soundtrack sounds good, you will always notice that the musicians around you will look at each other and say, whoa, those drums. So drums are an important thing to focus on, and let's start with that. Um, first, let's look at a bass drum, and look at it from, a, from an analytic perspective. Um, imagine you have a drum sample that you like very much, uh, but you can't store it because it's too big, and you want to recreate something like this. So you, you just open it in your favorite um, audio editing software and look at the waveform and maybe frequency analyze and so on. You will notice that the drum, when it gets hit, basically has some bass frequency that drops down. You, you, if you have a large bass drum and you hit the membrane with a hammer, the membrane will start to wobble, and when it wobbles, it gets a little longer and a little shorter, so it starts with a higher frequency and goes down to the lower frequency. Um, Bero uh, has, especially on these slides, collected a couple of parameters that work very well for a bass drum, which we will show in just a second, um, where he has these wonderful uh, long floating point numbers. There's a, a frequency pitch, so the, the basic frequency of this drum goes down from 152 hertz to 48 hertz during the duration of the drum. Um, but a drum is not just a single frequency, it's not just a single sine wave that just goes down but it has a lot of higher harmonics. When you hit a drum with a hammer, you excite its basic frequency and the higher harmonics and the higher harmonics and so on. Um, so what you can do is do an additive synthesis. You take the bass frequency and you take the higher harmonics and add them on top of each other until the thing sounds drummy. Now, if you are in the idealized world where a drum is a mathematical object, your frequency series will go from the fundamental, it's called F0M here, to higher frequencies, higher frequencies. For example, the fifth harmonic F5M. And in, in an ideal world, these are the bass frequency, twice the bass frequency, three times the fre bass frequency, and so on. Um, that is not how the real world works, however, because in an actual drum, when you hit it, the higher frequencies will move a little faster, and the lower frequencies will move a little slower, and there's different damping. So the actual higher harmonics become unharmonic. So for example, here's a series that was from the same sample um, extracted, which shows that the higher harmonics start to shift more and more upwards. So you have 1, 2, 3 is still basically 1, 2, 3, then you have 4.05, 5, uh, 4.07, 5.07, 6.17, and so on and so on. <coughs> 
If you want to overdo this, you can use the entire harmonic series of this drum, but eventually you have diminishing returns. So you synthesize your bass frequency as a sign and your higher frequencies and you add them, but you can't just add them all with the same volume because if you do that, uh, you will only hear the high frequencies and low frequencies get drowned out. Um, but the higher frequencies should go down in amplitude. So again, if you look at the frequency spectrogram of your drum, you will notice that from the lower one to the higher ones here, zeroth harmonic frequency is uh, amplitude, for example, is minus 6 decibel, then goes to minus 14, minus 25, minus 53, and so on. If you just take this, the, the, the thing that's prescribed here, add a little bit of noise in the beginning, which just gives you the, the, the noise of the actual mallet hitting the drum, um, which just should be spiking very quickly, going up, going down, just to have the sound of the thing hitting, and then the bass drum resonating a little bit longer, and then fade the whole thing out as the drum so uh, fades out. You get something that sounds quite a bit like a drum. And now let's switch to the example. Um, this is Barrow Scream Tracker. It's a tracker software he wrote himself in, in Object Pascal, and as everything that Barrow does, it's completely over-engineered. It uh, comes with its all own um, audio synthesis description language. So instead of importing samples, what you can do is render samples and synthesize stuff on the fly in this descriptive programming language that gets bytecode compiled to, uh, or actually compiled to x86 assembly and then packed as a custom synthesizer into the production. And um, here you can see at the bottom is the Aulan source code uh, where the, the exact parameters that we saw on the previous slide are being fed in and it has modal synthesis, so modal synthesis is simply adding multiple no modes on top of each other, adding them with appropriate amplitudes and de let letting them decay over time. And if we play, press play, you can hear that this sounds kind of like a bass drum. You hear and you see at the beginning that there's a bit of noise, which is this initial noise punch as the bass drum gets hit, and then the frequencies just dimming over time. So that's in taking these numbers, putting them in, gives you a good basic bass drum. But that's not the only bass drum you might want. So let's go on to bass drum variant two. Um, ah, I forgot to say, if you go back the slide and the last point, in basically all of the instruments we're going to um, explain, normalization is kind of important. If you have your, your, just your synthesis with some numbers, you may end up with in, uh, instrument at very different volumes and you have to make sure that um, the, the perceived volumes of them are kind of in the right range. And if you add multiple of them on top of each other, make sure that you don't clip because then stuff starts to sound horrible. Uh, so that's going to more or less be the last point in every of these slides and I might skip over that because it's always the same. So based on variant two, that is something that um, gets used very commonly in uh, small um, productions like 4Ks because it's very easy to do. It's based on what the Roland TR909 bass drum synthesizer did back in the day, in the I think, late 80s, early 90s, where it was an analog synthesizer that was producing bass drum sounds. Um, what you do is you take a sine wave, which is not actually a sine wave because in the, in the case of the TR909 it was a triangle wave that was filtered a bit to make it a little bit rounder. So take a dirty sine wave, you can for example just use a triangle oscillator, filter it a little bit, the low pass filter it a little bit and you get a sinusoid like waveform. And um, you take that and you start from a very high frequency, you can more or less choose which one that is and let it drift down rapidly to a frequency of, well, in the order of, in the original TR909, it's 53.78 hertz, but on the order of 50 hertz. Um, and make, g give a very short attack time to the sound and a, well, a decay time that you would expect from a, uh, from a drum. So, I don't know, half a second, a little bit less. Uh, well, maybe, maybe half a second is too long, maybe a couple of milliseconds. Um, again, you add a little bit of noise in the beginning for the, for the, for the punch and you get something that you will probably instantly recognize from uh, 4Ks. If we play the sound, the, the example of that. Uh, 
Ah, yes, that would be the next point. There is the zero at the bottom. Yeah, okay. So what you can see here is that this kick at the beginning is the same, and then there's a, a higher frequency that goes to lower and lower frequencies. And I think this can be can be played at different nodes, can't it? Like the starting frequency can be altered. Or if you go to kind of high frequency. Ah. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, uh, let's let's go back to the slide first. Um, this sounds like a, a very standard techno drum because the TR909 was the instrument in the day to produce techno music. It also ki sounds, compared to the previous drum, that sounded a bit more physical and drummy, kind of cheap. But it's a very important trick in for good electronic kick drums is to layer them, which means you take one cheap bass drum and you take another cheap bass drum and another one with slightly different detuned parameters. You just cluster them around all your parameter space and just add them on top of each other and then renormalize to, to keep the volume um, in check. Um, this is called the layering drum, layering drum, drum trick and it's generally always a good idea in all kinds of compositions to layer drums to make them sound more uh, well, more punchy and also in the case of bad drums a little more physical. So if we now here you hear that now four of them are being added with slightly different parameters and um, immediately you notice that this sounds more punchy and fuller. So here's just the, the different parameters of the uh, drums slightly altered. Yes, if you like to um, use code to describe your instruments, this is the tool for you to use. If you if you more uh, rather like to use a note system to kick stuff together, there is or was already the seminar on f uh, um, synthesis um, uh, in 64 clang by Gopher. Who else was it? Punctured, I think. Um, there was this other seminar, or is I'm not sure. I was coding 64k. Um, anyway. That is the second way you can make a bass drum that also sounds kind of good. Um, but then there is a third way, um, and that is the hard style and hardcore kick drum. That is basically if you, for example, if you're a coder and you're not good at all with making any kind of music and you have no uh, audio skill but you still want to just make your demo loud, this is the usual recipe to add to it. Um, you can take your standard bass drum synthesis, like one of the previous ones, the, the dropping down in frequency or your, your um, modal synthesis, uh, you can take that as a bass and then distort it. And the, the most basic way you can make anything more distortive is exchange the sine waves for more cornery waveforms. You can use triangle waves, you can use square waves. And then you can also, we will come to distortion a little bit later, um, multiply and saturate it, you can clip it, and you can just make nasty, nasty things to it. The bass drum is quite um, immune to being mistreated uh, uh, if at the end you want a hard style sounding kick drum. And again, we have an audio example for this. So as you can see, this is the, the race uh, directory. Um, that was the 64K from Barrel that was played in um, yesterday's 64 kilobyte competition. The one with the racing gliders that had a very nice, fancy electronic soundtrack. Um, ah, and this is from Mr. Techno, which is the 64K uh, from a while back. Ah, but unfortunately this one file he's looking for is only on his other machine upstairs. But can you just, for example, take the, the previous the 909 drum and distort it a bit or add um, change the, the oscillator? 
Jetzt wird es so, wie wir wollen. Basically, live coding example. You see how your bass drum changed from a nine to a square. And this is what a hard style bass drum immediately sounds like. Uh, here you see this is something that will come up asymmetric soft clip with just a lot of punch to it. Um, so yeah, uh, if you either don't know what you're doing and just want to have it loud, or you know exactly what you're doing um, and want to give your drums more texture, Distortion never hurts. Okay. Uh, next up, snare drums. The snare drum, of course, has a similar setup to a bass drum in that you're hitting a membrane. But uh, the difference is that in a snare drum, you have these, these, these wires running through that oscillate at very specific frequencies and that give it a, well, a much brighter, much snarier sound. Um, again, we start with a additive synthesis way of doing this. You can um, start with the more more fundamental tonal frequencies and again these are numbers that the bear sampled from from some samples you add three triangles at these frequencies and then you add another uh, to sine frequencies on top but then important um, is to add more wide noise to it because the snare the attack of it uh, the the wires oscillating under the membrane hitting it give it a lot longer snare and a lot more uh, uh, noise part at the beginning in a lot more noisy sound. If you sum all of these parts, just do three triangles, three si uh, two sines, and a low pass with that white noise, then you get something that sounds like a very good typical electronic snare. If we now find <laughs> the file for this. Here you see already that this is higher frequencies and you see a lot more noise happening at the beginning. You mostly hear the decaying uh, um, noise envelope, but there is tonal components in there that you've modeled additionally to it. So that is the basic additive, uh, additive synthesis flair. Go back to the uh, uh, video once you've watched this talk and just copy the numbers and you get a, a very good recipe for a basic snare. That's variant one. And then um, I think we have a, a, a second variant coming up in the, in the uh, next part. And the other typical instrument that you will need in your basic electronic music setup is a hi-hat. Um, and the, the typical run-of-the-mill cheap way to do this is to band pass white noise. Because if you think of what a closed hi-hat does, it's two metal discs that slam together at some random position and just wobble around a bit until they close. So you have white noise of randomly hitting metal pieces and then an envelope as they close. So just a short, and like a steep increase and a short fall of, of, your, of your volume. And then, um, you can add a little bit of, of feedback delay uh, to it because when the, the two metal discs of your, of your timbals hit in one side, the sound travels over and changes it here and then it changes it back and it can oscillate within this, this closed cavity just to make it a little bit more sound, a little bit more metallic and a little bit more uh, realistic. There's no tonal component in here. This is just a very short sound. And there's different varieties of this. You can change the shape of your envelope, and you can change how much um, your delay line, your uh, feedback delay line resonance is. And it gets, uh, the, the, the more the feedback, the more metallic it can become if you uh, choose your parameters right. OK. This gives us a bass drum, a um, snare, and a hi-hat. You may also still want a tambourine, and a tambourine is now an interesting thing. If you want to get this sound t sounding correctly, you have to do something you don't really hear. Um, because a, a very good recipe for a tambourine is you, you take band pill pass filters with a relatively narrow band pass, white noise, 
Um, but you don't just add one uh, volume envelope of rising and falling, but it's, it's a very good idea to have two volume envelopes, rising and falling, and then a short time later, rising and falling again. And you have to tune the parameters a little bit so that you don't hear them as two separate uh, rising and falling envelopes anymore. Your brain then has these two signals coming in and decides that they must have come from the same source and combines them. But you still have a little bit a little bit different sound coming out of it and it makes it sound much more plastic than if you were just taking a band, filter, band filtered white noise thing. Um, again, this can be seen here that you have a, a first punch and a second punch going in and it's just white noise, but if you listen to it, at high enough frequency, you hear it's very fast and your brain kind of doesn't hear the two separate ones anymore. It's especially when this is integrated into a, a track, this gets basically logically combined to one, but it gives it this little bit more texture and then it's, a, then it's an interesting um, instrument to use. Okay, that was the, the basic uh, uh, drums that you can just simply build together from a couple of components and then get something that sounds good. But we can do a bit better. Um, because if you have a drum you really, really like as a sample and you're trying to recreate it and you just can't manage, how to, uh, manage to do it um, additive, uh, additively by just adding stuff together, by just thinking about how the drum works, eventually you can give up and decide to just take your sample, but taking a sample into your 64K uses up a lot of space. Um, or you can use a different representation of sound and use a Fourier transform-based or inverse Fourier, Fourier transform-based drum synthesis. This is similar to what the PAD synth does. Um, it's, a, it's a way of synthesizing sounds from Fourier space by just specifying a, a bell curve in frequency space. I want some noise in this general tonal area and then you just throw in random numbers, inverse Fourier transform it and get very nice organic sounding PAD sounds. Um, but instead of creating uh, just a, a Gaussian bell surf in frequency space, you first go and listen to your sample again, the one that you really liked, the one that you wanted to use, and you, you, you take it and put in your favorite audio processing software and Fourier transform it to get its, its frequency space um, representation. And then you can take only a small amount of um, items from it. So you get a, for example, 200, if you take an originally 64k samples um, FFT and you take only 256 samples from it and you save these simply as quantized values. You can you crunch them down to very low bit rates. It's not that important to get them represented exactly. So for example, eight bit, uh, quantized 8-bit byte values. Then you can, during runtime, if you have a small compact Fourier transform in your code, recreate a sound that's very similar to the original, original sample by just creating a 64K array again, filling it with entirely random values, just random noise, and then um, Fourier transforming that, adding random phases to the result, and um, uh, so, so you, you take your, the data that you have here, apply it to it so that you, you modulate your, your um, amplitudes in Fourier space with these 256 FFT, interpolating it in between, randomize the phases, inverse for it, transform it, which is basically just the same with a different sign, and you get something out that has a very similar spectral shape as your original drum. And then you get a volume envelope on top of it, which for drums is mostly easy to model, unless you have a very, very weird drum. And um, then you can see if it listens, uh, if it sounds like your original drum. And there are some examples for that. So yesterday, in the race, there were some of these. For example, the symbol. So that is taken from an actual symbol sample, um, reduced to 256 bytes of FFT data, and then recreated using that. Do you have the original sample for that, just so that we can compare how that sounds? Well, it's, it's from a sample library, but you have this specific one. I mean, it would be nice to, to just compare 
the, the very same thing. Ah, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, he will he will talk about that in in the workshop, which will be happening later today, where you can actually try this yourself. So, uh, unfortunately, we cannot do the the direct sample to sample comparison. Um, but again, if you if you uh, look at all or sound, listen to the different hi hats and metal instruments here, that do give a, a re realistic um, impression of these these kinds of instruments. Um, you exactly you you take your favorite instruments for example a clap as well sample from the FFT data and with a re relatively compact composition you can recreate them of course in 4k using 256 um bytes is already way too much, but for 64K this can be very nice, especially since people do pay a lot of attention to drums in that category. Okay. So, um, this tends to work really, really well for noise-heavy drums, since you are filling your, your sample area with noise, basically, with your, your FFD pre-filled with noise, and then you just shape away that you get approximately the same frequency response as your um, as your original uh, sample. So hi hats, rides, tambourines, everything that's um, basically when you hit it has a strong noise response. Um, it does not work for all kinds of very tonal instruments. So bass drums can work, might not work. It can probably not very well work for something like a a, a symbol that you just want to s have ringing at its uh, fundamental frequency for a long time, but you have to try it. Um, but, <coughs> sorry, that was the drum sound. Um, the, the, the drums that people pay a lot of attention to being the bass drum and the, the, the metal instruments, um, the, the metal parts you can, as you just heard, do very convincing ones using this method. And of course, it's always a good idea to have a Fourier transform in your code, a compact Fourier transform, because you can do all kinds of funky stuff with it. Also, filters in uh, Fourier space that you would have a hard time otherwise designing, and so on. But now, moving away from drums, and since we're always almost half through the time already, um, we can now go to another piece of instrument that's um, interesting and that you don't hear very often in size-limited productions, and that's string instruments. We start with an acoustic guitar and then work ourselves up to uh, more complicated things. So, as opposed to a, a, a drum or a, uh, just an oscillator, how do you create sound on a guitar? You plug a string and sound comes out. What is happening there? You plug a string in the middle and the string oscillates, so waves run back and forth and under it there's a resonating body and the w um, air gets pushed in and out, so that's sound waves. If you want, you can, of course, model this as an actual string, like Mars is connected by little connections, and you m uh, simulate the, the uh, sound waves running through this. And if you have a uh, supercomputer in your basement, which I happen to have at work, then that works, but it is not usually suitable for uh, 64K or smaller productions. So you have to cheat it a little bit and build a good model of what actually happens to sound waves, after, uh, sound waves as they travel through the string back and forth. Um, and there's one easy way to do this, which is called the Karplus strong algorithm, um, which basically just takes a noise burst as your initial pick, or, I mean, you could also be slamming the instrument, or you could just, I don't know, excite it in some way. So you just take a short noise burst and put it into this delay loop. There's a delay loop where the signal comes in, it gets delayed by a couple of samples, then it gets filtered a little bit, and it goes back. It gets delayed by a couple of seconds, filtered, and so on and so on. And the resulting thing that comes out here goes to the output. Now this filter has to be chosen in such a way that it dampens all frequencies at least a little bit. Otherwise this delay loop will just grow in frequency and will sound horrible and your ears will fall off. Um, 
This is typically a low pass filter since in a in a guitar the, the in a guitar string the higher frequencies the higher oscillations just rub atoms against each other and they get damped quickly whereas the low uh, frequency oscillations they just move back and forth through the guitar. So when you plug you excite a noise burst which has some very high frequencies they fall off quickly and the low ones will stay for a while. But then the, uh, the, the most important thing is this delay line because that is where when you plug the string it takes a while for the wave to go up and then to go down the string again. And that's, it, this is exactly what determines your, um, the frequency of, of the string you just plucked. Now if you want to be all physical, you can of course calculate the sound speed in your, in your string and you can calculate its length and then you can see how long it takes to pr for the propagation to go back and forth and you can calculate this into this delay line. Um, but if you really just want to create a note, you can just calculate this delay line to be one period of your note and put that delay in to get the desired note out. Now, if we want to use this for a guitar, we have to actually use two of these because um, in a guitar, you don't plug the, the string on one end, you plug it somewhere in the middle. So you actually, when you plug it here, you have one wave going this way and one wave going that way, and then they meet again and again and again and again. So what you actually need is two of these couple of strong delay lines, um, one going right, one going left, and they're coupled in a way that the signal coming out here gets fed over from the basically the, the top knot of the guitar reflection into the second one that goes back to the bridge. There's a little bit of coupling and reflection and the, the, the loss filter that we had in the previous slide going on there, and then it goes all around again. And the resulting sound that comes out from your guitar body in the middle is just these two wave, the, the two delay lines coming back and forth. And I guess that now is time to first show the, the analog one, or should we first continue with the electric part? Okay, um, we, can, we can first carry on before we show this with the electric guitar part, because that so far was an acoustic guitar, so you have strings that you plug and then that just resonates off. Um, but the more interesting use of a guitar, of course, is to make electric guitar sounds to really rock out. So how do we extend this now to turn this into an electric guitar? Um, an electric guitar is basically the same car plus strong uh, algorithm with a little bit of extension, which we'll come to in a second. And you have a couple of strings on your guitar. It doesn't have to be the, the realistic six you can use huge guitars in, if you simulate them, why not? Which are added together and going into a guitar amplifier. Now, in an in a idealized world, in the coder's view of the world, an amplifier simply amplifies the signal, so it multiplies it by a number and makes it larger. But that is not how guitar amplifiers actually work in real world. Especially if you rock out, you don't operate an amplifier in the range where it is linear, because if it is linear, it is boring. Um, but you operate it, you turn everything up to 11, you operate everything outside of its specification and it just turns horribly non-linear and that's what gives it the characteristic sound. So your signal comes in, it gets louder, then the electronics can't handle it and distorts it and then it gets softened again to be within a suitable audio range and then it goes out your speaker. But the signal generation doesn't stop when it goes out your speaker because in an actual electric guitar when you're standing next to your speaker the speaker will push out sound waves they travel through the room with a little bit of delay and hit your strings again and excite your strings so you can actually have a feedback loop all around so our couple strong gets a little bit of an addition up here where you have the feedback input so you create your sound the same way as before this uh, output comes out goes through your amplifier and then comes back here in here from the feedback of the room input and excites your strings again. Now, what does an, an amplifier look like if, if you have an a unrealistic non-linear behavior, if you have an amplifier that works in a certain range and then above it and below it doesn't, uh, you could use a hard clip function. So in the middle area between minus one and one, it just goes linear and above it it clips and below it it clips. This is the kind of distortion you get when you work with limited integer values and you just clip at their edges. Um, it is distorting, but it's not what a guitar amplifier looks like. You can make it a little more soft by um, uh, taking a, a function here that is, that is rounder near the edges, which has a more or less linear area in the middle and then a little bit of round of at the edges. I'll show a picture in a bit. Or you can actually 
go and look at what does a tube amplifier do when hit with too much power. A cathode ray tube in an amplifier is normally designed to be operated at its smallest linear working point, but then once you drain too many electrons from your cathode, it behaves one way, and once you put too many in there and your plasma physics start to go into play, you get another way. So um, there's a paper, for example, that just gives this formula for this wonderful formula for the uh, nonlinear reaction behavior of an amplifier tube. Um, now, don't give too much mind into understanding this. The important part is uh, going to be in the next two slides, exactly. Um, if your input is just a very loud sine wave and you hard clip it, so this is what your sound card does if you drive it too much, more or less, um, then you just chop off the tops here and there. And this, these sharp corners mean that there's high frequency components and it will sound very nasty. The soft clip formula that we, show, that we showed before is a little bit more round around the edges, but an actual guitar amplifier looks something a lot more like this, where you either deplete your entire electron, uh, electron cloud around your cathode and then it just cuts off, but in the other direction it has a much smoother uh, reaction and then it looks like this. If you look at the amplification as a function of your input value creating some output value, the hard clip we have is just clipping here and clipping there. The soft clip is doing this a little more smoothly and the actual or the more advanced model for the asymmetric soft clip looks something like this. Once you have implemented this, you can always use it to distort other things as well as we've seen before in the drums. Um, and then is the question of the feedback line in the room. You simulate how your, your room, how, how you, the sound travels from your speaker back to the guitar and excites the strings, which means you have to have, basically you keep in mind that not all frequencies come out of your speaker. For example, this Celestion 12-inch speakers um, go from 130 to 5,000. Then not all of these frequencies actually propagate very far uh, through the room. Uh, uh, above a certain frequency threshold, air just has too much resistance and you can add a little bit of a filter there to, to dampen the high frequencies. And then um, you have a certain distance from your speaker, you're not playing right next to it unless you're weird, um, but you can just guesstimate how far away you want your guitarist to stand from the speaker to give a, a appropriate feedback delay. And of course, how far away you are from the speaker determines at what frequency your resonances may happen if they happen, if you want them to happen. And again, now comes the big demonstration. Vero has implemented all this in his audio language, Aulan. Lots of different implementations. turn everything to 11. <laughs> um, now can you, can, can you um, turn this basically back into an acoustic guitar by easily disabling the, the electronic part of it? So here just the distortion. Distortion gain is set to zero and uh, feedback gain is set to zero, so suddenly you get a acoustic guitar playing in a nice hall. And it's the very same note input that produced this, can, can you play again? This quite pleasant sounding sound in a large environment as compared to the total destruction of the sound by the electric guitar. Let's compare that again.
nice. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, apparently there's more, exa more examples coming. I've actually not heard all of them myself. <laughs> Yeah, um, depending on what kind of demo you want to do. Of course, every uh, of these um, synthesis algorithms, and especially Kaplus Strong, always has um, certain application ranges where it sounds really bad and really synthetic. But um, an important part about playing a synthetic guitar is not just creating the sound of one string correctly, but what you have to do is also um, keep in mind that when you're playing a guitar, you're not just picking a string here and then a string here and then a string here, but the way you're playing it should be somehow encoded in the in your note schedule so that you're actually strumming your notes. And when you're coming back, you don't have an infinite Im amount of, of strings that you just keep triggering, 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 but you should somehow keep in mind that you mostly have like maybe six, or depending on what kind of chords you play, maybe only two or three um, strings that you're exciting over and over. Um, and that the initial pickup noise is also very important for making it, making it sound like an actual guitar, not just an Indian zither that you coupled with an e-guitar amplifier, even though that would be cool. Okay, um, now that we've played um, an st instrument with a small amount of strings, we can of course just go larger and do more amount of strings. Now I have to warn you that these slides here are a little bit thin because we uh, ran mo uh, out of time with creating slides, but this will mostly be shown um, by example. Now a piano, as you may know, is simply also a string instrument, a guitar with 100 and something strings, so that's what you can model it as. Um, you basically do um, Car plus strong synthesis is one way. Then you can go into much more details. And if you if you Google the commuted waveguide synthesis, there's the gory details. Or you can again do modal synthesis if you um, if if you have an actual piano at home and you measure your your relative frequencies and your resonance modes, uh, similar to we did the uh, how we did the drums. But um, the the easiest one coming from the guitar now is to take a digital waveguide, Kaplus Strong, you, you basically have in an actual piano three strings at slightly different frequencies, little bit detuned um, from one another, connected to each of the keys. And it gets triggered by a hammer hitting it. So instead of just adding a noise burst, simply adding a noise burst, which corresponds to plucking the string, you need a hammer simulation that hits the string. And then you need three interconnected digital waveguides, so three of these strings going, and you can have, if you want multiple notes playing at the same time, you need to have all of these sitting there, so you may need per piano voice up to 12, or depends on how crazy you want to go, more digital waveguide instances. So this can be computationally quite heavy, um, since you have lots of buffers, lots of delay buffers to iterate through, and lots of filters to, to evaluate. Um, the, the computed waveguide synthesis is a more advanced way to do this, which may be a little bit faster, but also more complicated, and I'm not sure if we're going to show it, but we'll see. And yeah, the modal synthesis is then, again, the one where you go back to your actual piano and measure the, the frequencies and stack your modes additively instead of going through the couple strong, which, if you do it well, sounds very good, but if you don't do it well, it sounds very cheap. Couple strong is has the benefit of being, if you don't know what you're doing, just implement it, you still get something that sounds impressive. Um, now, the hammer modeling means that these three thing, things get hit by a hammer at the same time and get hit, excited with a, with a very similar, um, well, with a, a similar envelope, but it's not a, just a noise burst. And there's different hammer models um, that you can find by Googling either Stulov or uh, Banks hammer. Um, I think there is a diagram on the next slide about how this thing works. Um, so basically, the, there's a lot of wave uh, of delay lines sitting in here and response functions, um, because what you have is you have your different strings and your hammers hitting them in the middle. So you basically simulate your hammers hitting, hitting the string in the middle, but it is coupling the different strings among each other. 
And then the, the long part of the string is traveling backward and forward, and they are all again connected by a transfer function to the common bridge. So if you hit one of the strings, all of them will get excited somewhat unharmonically, and some of them are dampened faster, and some of them are not so fast, and then this whole thing will need to be combined to create an actual piano sound. When you hit a key on the piano, you never just excite one string, you basically excite the entire neighborhood. And um, I think this um, piano synthesis was the, the central part of the soundtrack of Sweet Night Dreams, which was Barrow 64K one or two years ago, um, where there was this wonderful scene where an actual Ray March piano was playing the actual soundtrack created by this um, Carpel Strong synthesis. Let's see if we find it. You turn it up a little. It's of course much more quiet than the electric guitar. Can you just amplify it a little bit in the in the Auland's house, or do you have a why works more better? Yeah. Here you see now um, the model parameters that you can put into um, this um, couple of strong uh, or the, the entire piano uh, setup. And I guess if you play with them a little bit, you will notice how the sound changes. What's a good parameter to, to play with? Ah, now comes a more complex piano example. Um, I'm actually looking forward to that myself. Once you have a piano in there, you can do a wide range of things. Especially the, the long, long sounding notes that it's never just a, a single frequency that's oscillating in here, but when you excite one note, you hear the entirety of the soundboard, the entire um, frame of the piano resonating. And um, now, as the, the last example, Bero has also implemented the commuted waveguide, which is the, the more complex um, setup that uh, there unfortunately was not so much time to put a slide together for. So this is not a complete track, but you will uh, give it to you.
Um, so uh, again, as you, you may have heard at the beginning that some of the, the low notes played with the strong volume on the piano um, are on the edge of what this hammer simulation does realistically. It may sound, if you, if you hit it too hard, it may sound like a harpsichord because it again sounds more plucky than it sounds hammery. Um, so you should always be aware of if you have a, a synthesis, synthesis model, what its boundaries are, and then you may want to consider um, hiding it, cheating, because that's what the demo scene is about. Um, or if you really want to go into the extra effort, then um, you, you can again go into the um, method of reconstructing your sounds from IFFT or from, from other reconstruction methods. Um, now in this track, everything was procedural. There was no IFFT based uh, thing happening. So the drums you heard, the piano you heard, um, all, all the instruments were being done in this procedural manner within this, this Cream Tracker framework. Um, and should I say something about the workshop that will be happening? I think the, um, we've now, since the time is basically over, we've also reached the end of the slides. There will be um, a, a workshop about this happening in the evening, I think at 8. Uh, you should check the timetable. Um, and if you want to have access to the synth, to the, to the Aulan framework and the, the Cream Tracker, you should uh, talk to Barrow. I don't know if it's public yet, is it? Is it not yet? Ah, it will be uh, publicized sometime later today, uh, probably going along with a couple of, of um, presets that you can then start and play with, including some of the instruments you may have heard here. So um, we are thanking you for your attention and we are open very much to questions as long as there's time. Seems like everybody is now very eager to uh, jump in and synthesize drums, pianos, and guitars. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing some guitars in 64, some more guitars in the 64K compo in the future. Um, and I may want to implement some of these yourself because this does sound kind of impressive. Okay, so thank you all very much. And um, if you are now excited about this, you can come to the workshop at eight and have a try at it yourself. And thank you, Beryl.